Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Perfectly Mentored. I'm your host, Jason Portnoy. Uh, today, I'm super, super stoked for this guest. I absolutely love him. Uh, I've been following him uh, for a long time. When I first had my e-commerce store, I've been using his advice. And now with the agency, uh, I definitely learn a lot uh, that my clients benefit from. Ezra Firestone is on the show. He's the CEO of Smart Marketer, the man behind uh, tons of e-commerce brands that generate over $20 million, uh, including Boom by Cindy Joseph. Uh, you know, the biggest thing that I love about Ezra is that he practices what he preaches and he's a teacher that loves to help uh, and not just one that just wants to milk every dollar out of low hanging fruit. He actually comes from a good place and wants to help people and really um, walks the walk and talks the talk. So Ezra, welcome to the show. Hey man, thanks for having me on. What do we got going on uh, behind you here? What's that green monster looking dude up there? What's the story so, with all that? Right here is my Mike Tyson signed punch out picture. Okay. Best video game of all time. Fair uh, enough. And then all my, my evaluation of Tyson is, I guess, 50, 50. We'll have to talk <laughs> about that privately. Uh, and then my, uh, my toys from when I was a child. So wow, yeah, you got he man up there, Hulk Hogan. I can see Andre the giant. Yeah. Um, Original Ninja Turtles, the green Slimer from Ghostbusters. Wow. That's all, what I'm looking at. Original. That one really pops, the green yeah. Slimer. Yeah. yeah, and then you have the original Game Boy and the original iPod. Wow, oh, look yeah. at that. Game Gear, is that a Game Gear? That's a Game Gear. Wow. Okay, sorry, man. Hey, I'm here. Thank you for having me on the show. I love doing this kind of stuff. I love talking to business owners, entrepreneurs, people who are out there doing it. Um, you know, my, my business is... Um, my passion, one of my passions, I'd say it's like the second thing I'm most passionate about in my life besides my relationship with my wife. And I put a lot of time and energy into it. And uh, it's really fun. I like to talk about it, you know, and um, I think that that one of the things that has come from the sort of uh, digital medium, the internet culture that, that we've grown up in that wasn't available to like our parents is a ability to more easily connect with people who are interested in the same things that we are. And and through conversation about it, everyone's sort of level goes up. So it's kind of like a, it's a, it supports you in your growth, you know? hundred percent. I agree with you. Um, for, for the people who've lived under a rock, especially the e-commerce store owners uh, who live under a rock and don't know you, why don't you just do a quick intro of who you are, how you got started? Sure. Um, I am a guy who does e-commerce and I really like it. I've got 70 employees now. We do over 25 million a year in revenue. I've been at it since 2005, so I kind of like grew up in this industry, and I've seen every, I've seen it all uh, in terms of internet years, like like 13 years, 14 years, and in internet years is a really long time in terms of what has changed and what the strategies are and what's going on. And you know, I started as a professional poker player in New York City when I was a teenager, uh, playing the underground circuit, and uh, you know, kind of realized that there was probably a better model than trading time for money. And, you know, if you're a poker player, you're up all night, you sleep all day, you're hanging out with degenerates, you're under fluorescent lights at 3 a.m., banging down butterfingers. I mean, it's a terrible look, dude. So uh, I met a guy who was um, selling stuff on the internet way back in 04, 05. And um, he was selling information. He was selling eBooks which, um, and using search engine optimization as the visibility source to sell his uh, informational products. Uh, because at that time, you know, SEO was really the way that you generated visibility if you had any kind of offer, uh, be it a service, a physical product, an information product, whatever it was. Um, and so I learned about SEO from him and, and kind of ended up taking over his business. And he was interesting because he was like, he was uh, one of the guys who started one of the first uh, life coaching uh, certification places that has now gone on to be one of the world's largest uh, you know, organizations that certifies life coaches. And this was before, like now, you know, it's 2019 and coaching is a mainstream concept. Like there's business coaches, health coaches, relationship, everyone knows what a coach is. But back then, like coaching had not penetrated the mainstream in the same way. And so it was like a new thing. And he was kind of on the forefront of that. Um, and that was a pretty cool model. But anyways, through him, I learned about SEO and through working on his business, I which was an influencer business. It was based on his persona and it, he was selling information much like I do at Smart Marketer, right? Smart Marketer is a influencer based brand based on my persona where I sell courses, trainings, and events. Um, great model, but 
ultimately I, I made the decision that I wanted to have a model that was agnostic of a persona. And that's how I found e-commerce. And, um, the, the model of e-commerce that existed back then was drop shipping, but not drop shipping as we know it today. We know drop shipping today of like you ship stuff over from China. This was a American drop shipping where you'd find a, a supplier who had bar stools in Minnesota and you'd take their catalog and you'd put it on your website. And it's a funny story. You know about Wayfair? W-A-Y. Okay. Wayfair is worth about 6 billion. They started around the same time I did drop shipping physical products, grandfather clocks and bird feeders uh, from manufacturers in America. And what they understood at that time that I didn't was systems, processes, and scale. And they grew that drop. They're now still one of the world's largest drop shippers. They're still doing that model. Uh, I only ever launched like 15 or 20 drop ship stores. I made good money. I made, you know, my first million in drop shipping in 08. Um, but, but anyways, the point is like, that's, that's how I, that's me. I'm the, I'm that guy. And I, and in 2012, I started, uh, kind of documenting my journey, created a blog. A lot of people liked it. And I was fortunate enough to be one of, it's kind of like, man, if you get to be one of the first people, you tend to gain popularity. So I was fortunate enough to be one of the first people to really do, um, high level blogging for e-commerce in particular. Like, Hey, here's what I'm doing in my e-commerce store. And I've not, I really enjoy sharing what works for me and like talking about it. And so that blog smart marketer has grown into a, a really great business, but it's still probably like 20% of what I do. I mean, I mostly run my e-commerce brands. I kind of do this information business on the side, but it's really fun. I love it. And I got a community there and it's like all my people, my e-commerce people, you know? Um, so anyways, that's a, a sort of a general review of who I am. If you don't know me. Awesome. Uh, when I have someone like you on, I almost feel like it's a waste for, to the listeners to not get into some great tactical advice and really just tap into your brain. Is that okay? If we, if we yeah, just man, let's do it. I'm here. I'm present. I'm ready. Cool. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see e-com stores making today? Well, it kind of depends on the kind of e-commerce. You have a lot of people who are doing a turn and burn model where they're looking for the next whiz bang product and they're running ads. And like, you've seen this man, we've seen this. It was Teespring. It was drop ship from China. Before that, it was, um, it was the similar thing in the ebook world where it's like people are looking for one catchy product that they can run ads to and make a sale. They're not interested in uh, repeat customers, building a brand, adding value to the marketplace. And the reason that this got so popular is because it worked so well. I mean, I remember back in 2012 when you could literally take the same, um, you could take the same, let's say, I don't have one here, but black light flashlight that every other bum had, put your logo on it and put it on Amazon and literally make 50 grand a month. So the, this, this, this model of I have to invest nothing beyond uh, ads and listing a product, good, good uh, compelling ads and listing a product, and I'll make a bunch of money, was a model that worked for people. But it was a cash flow model. It was never a business. It was always just a way to make some cash. And people are really hung up on this, like, I want to make money quick. I want to make it now. And I'm only invested in trying to make a sale. And it's like that model will never take you very far. If you're not focusing on brand and community and engagement and value of the product when they receive it, like if you're not actually doing business with integrity, you're fucked, man. And pardon my language, but like you got all these young guys who are, who are like, trying to ball out on Instagram and wear their fancy watches and stand around Lambos and, you know, pass dollar bills in the air. And it's like, cool. If that's like what you're after, but I'm interested in doing things that are enjoyable. I first and foremost want to have fun and enjoy my work life. Secondly, I want to make incredible products that really add value to the marketplace that are different from what other people have. And third, I want to make a profit. I want to do it in that order. And I think that like my tagline in business and, is and, for, and, and for longevity, right? And you for want longevity, yeah. I mean, that is how you get to longevity. My tagline is serve the world unselfishly and profit. And I think that's a description. I think if you're in a role of service, you will profit. And I think that the number one mistake that I see is people look 12 months ahead instead of five years ahead. And I've been able to sustain in this business because I'm running a marathon. I'm not out trying to spear a fish. I'm out planting seeds and watering them every day and watching them grow mango trees and watching those trees fruit for generations, right? Like I'm interested in the slow growth approach where I'm building something of value over time and I'm looking further ahead than most people. Yeah, you and I spoke offline right before this started saying how, you know, 
there's this misconception that you think you could spend ten dollars a day on Facebook ads and build a business uh, and and get ten million dollars in, in revenue. Uh, my question, and and what people don't see is, you know, Movement Watches, for example, that sold for over two hundred million dollars. They spent years building up the brand, getting the social proof, putting out putting out uh, just just engagement posts to get to get enough content. How important is that for paid media? The like your content, the the idea to build a brand. How much easier does that make paid media for for an e-commerce store? I think like every big brand is going to spend money on advertising, right? You, you only make it in a couple ways. You make it through paid amplification, or you make it through press, traditional PR. You get picked up by a bunch of news outlets somehow, or you make it through some kind of organic, all of a sudden you rank, you know, you did a good content site and blog and you got ranked and you got some kind of organic visibility or you make it through comparison shopping engines. Like if you're talking e-commerce in particular, Amazon or uh, Google shopping or one of these like buyer engines where, where the buyers are there looking for products. I mean, there's not a whole lot of, there's other ways that people make it. There's affiliate, there's some other stuff, but it's like in general, if you look at everyone out there who's big, they mostly made it one of those like four or five ways. And so paid amplification is the easiest one to access, right? It's the, it's the simplest. You go to the traffic store, you buy the traffic. So that one, everyone has access to. Yeah, everyone has access to organic as well, but that's much slower growth. That's creating content, doing keyword research, building site authority over time. Everyone has access to traditional press, but not everybody has the money to hire a press a PR person or PR agency or gets lucky enough to just get reviewed. Um, everyone has access to affiliate, but not everyone knows how to go do the affiliate slash influencer model and spend the time to reach out to it. So paid amplification tends to be the one that is the most readily available and the one that most people leverage. And it's also like everybody who gets over a couple hundred grand starts to incorporate it because it's just a, it's additional fuel that pushes your car forward. And so in order to have it work and work consistently, you have to have something special. You have to have a story to tell. Like the, what I like to say is that your business engages with a group of people who are having a collective experience. So for example, my business is uh, speaking to women over 50 about the process of aging. That's a group of people who are sharing a collective experience. They're over 50 and they're aging and their bodies are aging and everybody is telling them that that's wrong. Anti-wrinkle, anti-age, tuck it in, tighten it up, Botox, dye your hair, don't let the gray show through. It's all this messaging about how your value is going down. Well, we take the opposite approach. We think that's all a bunch of bullshit. We think that your life, it's just like this, gets better over time. Uh, and that there's a different stage of beautiful at every stage of life. But anyways, the point is, your business has, is engaging with a group of people who are sharing a collective experience. And your job is to engage with them with content and add value to their life by commenting on that experience. A video that they see on Facebook that resonates with an experience that they're having that uh, talks to them about a problem that they're facing that then alludes to a solution, which is your product. And so the better that you can do that, the better your advertising will be. And if you just have some crappy me too product, it's going to be real hard to do that. Build, so, a, build a community. Yeah. And so what we do is we create content that comments on life experience of the group of people that we want to sell to, to build affinity and value and, and, and relationship with them. And we have products that are also related to that same group and that same experience that are unique in the marketplace in some way. And that's kind of the model for, it's not that, not that hard. It takes a while to organize, but once it's up, like you can make it work if you've done the, the pre-work. It's like you don't build a skyscraper without digging down and, and going down two stories so you got a strong foundation. A business is the same way. You, you, the, the taller the tree, the deeper the roots. And like people start and they wanna just go up. But it's like, man, you got to go down first. You got to build those roots out. You got to develop a product. You got to develop a message. You got to develop a, a viewpoint. It's like, there's a lot that goes into this, a lot of subtle stuff that is easy to do if, you, if you're paying attention, but that if you don't do, you really miss out on the opportunity to have a great business. So talk to me about that on a macro level. What does a perfect e-commerce funnel look like? Incorporating Facebook, incorporating everything from top all the way to retargeting. You know, the funnel is going to be dictated by the price point and the market. So for example, I used to sell $100,000 lots of land in Uruguay. And this was back in 09. And that was $100,000 that you had to pay if you wanted to buy a lot in this development. And I was the one who was responsible for getting you to pay that 100 grand. That sales cycle was a year long. From the time you typed in real estate Costa Rica on Google AdWords and I ran an ad and said, hey, are you considering investing in Costa Rica? You could make a huge mistake. Come learn about this. 
to the seven webinars that I put you through to the phone call that I got you on that got you down to come and check out the site to then give me your hundred grand for a lot. It's one year sales cycle. For someone who's going to pull out their credit card and buy a $10 widget, the sales cycle is much shorter. So the, the sales funnel and sales cycle is going to be dictated by the price point and the market. And so if you're selling something that's under 20 bucks or under 30 bucks, you can go from a sales video directly to a product page. If you're selling something like I'm selling that's more premium, more like a hundred bucks, well, you're going to want content sandwich in between your, advertor your advertisement and your product offer. So it kind of just depends on, on what you are selling. And also your market is going to dictate where you advertise. Like for me, everyone's all hot on Instagram, but guess what? Women over 50 aren't on Instagram. So I don't advertise there. I advertise on Facebook and YouTube because that's where they are. So there's not really a perfect scenario. There's what's right for whatever you're selling. Now, is it going to be likely Facebook, YouTube, Google Display Network, Google AdWords, Amazon, and Pinterest? Yeah. And Instagram? Yeah. It's going to be one of those, most likely. Um, and are you going to be either selling on a platform like Amazon or your own website? Yeah. Are you going to need a good sales video? Yeah. I mean, there's some stuff you're going to need, but it's kind of dependent upon what you're selling. What do you think about Amazon as a competitor to toward e-commerce stores? Like well, sort of 50, 50 cents out of every dollar spent on e-commerce in America is spent on Amazon. So they're pretty, they're, they're up there and they're growing. Third, uh, the, I think e-commerce grew like 15% year over year this year. And like 70% of the growth was Amazon's growth. Like they're just growing like crazy. And I think that um, if you have commodity products, you can't not be on Amazon. Uh, they're never going to be brand. They're always like, they, they just bought a big drugstore. They're doing like, they're going like they bought whole foods. They're going commodity food, drugs, meaning like pharmaceuticals and stuff. People take, um, you know, staples, uh, bathroom stuff. Like they're, they're like, they're doing all that. Uh, and they do a bunch of other stuff too, but like, that's the vertical that they're taking is that everyone, every home in America is going to need Amazon smart fridge and going to need to reorder their whole foods, lettuce or whatever. Right? Like, they're not really a competitor to niche uh, community-based content-focused brands. They're competitors to, like if you're selling a, 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 some kind of standard uh, you know, uh, toilet paper, you're going to want to be on Amazon. And I think you're going to want to be on Amazon anyways, right? Because one out of three people only shop there. So why wouldn't you also be there? It's an additional- well, The, the, the argument is if you're trying to build a brand- right? And you're selling on your website and you're selling the same product on Amazon, you're going to lose out to the app. You're going to lose out to Amazon, especially if people really haven't heard of you before. And then you don't own your own customers. Not true. That's a, that's a misinformed, misguided argument. You, you will have some people who choose to buy on Amazon. You'll run ads. Like for example, I have a $20 million e-commerce store with no sales on Amazon where I drive all my traffic from Facebook over to my store. I'm about to put it on Amazon. Will some of the people go and look and say, Hey, are these people on Amazon and buy it there? Yeah, they will. But that's a better buying experience for that customer. Those people want to be buying on Amazon anyways. So why, why not let them? You're missing out on a third of people who will just not buy from your website. So, so you're actually miss. If you talk to all the people who have big brands, who've moved them onto Amazon, it's an addition to sales, not a subtraction. And in the marketplace that we're in, Amazon's a big player. So you can either not embrace them and have all a bunch of knockoff brands be on there selling your stuff and miss out on a third of people who would buy there or embrace them and let people choose where they want to buy. You're here to serve your customers. You're not here to force them to buy from your site if they don't want to buy from there. Good but point. a large portion of them will still buy from your site if that's where all your advertising is going. What metrics are, are important for an e-commerce uh, store owner to pay attention to? And what are the benchmarks? Like return on ad spend, what do you typically see? Uh, what's the conversion rate on a website? These type of things. All that, that stuff is just irrelevant and market variable. The most important metric is repeat customer rate. That's what is going to dictate your success, period. Hey, look, you want to look at conversion rate? Well, then look at it desktop versus mobile. Look at it new visitors versus returning visitors. It's much more subtle than your overall conversion rate, which is what people like to talk about. Well, it's like, well, how are new visitors converting? How are returning visitors converting? How are desktop visitors converting? How are mobile visitors converting? You want to like look at it on that level and there's benchmarks for every category. But again, it's going to be dictated by where you're driving traffic from. For example, here's a great example. My website conversion rate was 1%. It then overall, it then jumped to 3%. You would think I made a big improvement. Well, you know what I did? I switched from running image ads to video ads. So instead of everyone clicking an image ad and going to my site, they all had to watch a video and then the people who watched the video clicked over. So much less people were ending up on the site and therefore the conversion rate increased. Didn't really change my business. 
you know what I'm saying? So it's like yeah. the metric is like, it's not really, it's yeah, you, we definitely pay attention to it. We optimize for it and stuff like that. But like what you really want to be looking at is your repeat customer rate. And if you can get that up to 40 to 50%, now you've got a business that's, that's worth something. If you're sitting in where most people are sitting, 10%, 15%, you got work to do. You need to be a minimum of 30% repeat. And you can do that. You don't need consumables. You can do that through cross sales and sales and stuff like that, uh, expanding your product catalog. Um, and then you need to look at your new versus returning customer ratio. If, if you have a graph, and I don't have the ability to draw it, but like if you start to see that your new customer ratio is going down and your returning customer ratio is going up, you're in trouble. You want them both to be going up. You want to be acquiring more new customers over time and more repeat customers. And if one of those starts to dip down, you got a problem you need to fix. So those are much more important metrics when we're looking at the holistic life of the brand, not just six months in front of us. Love that. Um, I, that's really well said. Uh, if, if you were to focus, we, we kind of touched on it really quickly about you know, how brands should spend their money. What's the ideal uh, budget allocation? So I am a big fan of reinvesting 100% of the profit back into the promotion of the brand. It's like, you know, your brand is like a snowball. And if you start pulling snow out, it doesn't get big, right? So you want to reinvest everything. Keep your side hustle. Keep your job. Let the brand reinvest everything for at least the first year, all the profit. Because then the snowball's huge by the time you start siphoning some off. Most people, as soon as it starts making money, start taking it out. And they, they pigeonhole their growth. They don't give themselves the opportunity to really grow because they're pulling energy out of this snowball. And so um, I think if you're not reinvesting a minimum of 50% of your profit back into the growth of your brand, which is inventory, paid amplification, expansion, design, photo shoots, email, stuff like that, then you're, you're really not allowing yourself to grow as fast as you could be. And what we spend is like, 30% of our top line revenue on ads. So if we make 24 million, or let's say we make 20, 10 million, we're going to spend 3 million on paid amplification the next year. And that's of top line. That's not of profit. And I think that if you're spending under 15%, you're, you, what, you, you're, you're making a mistake. So if your business does $100,000, then you need to spend a minimum of 15,000 on paid amplification. And at the high end, 30,000. That 15 to 30% of your top line revenue number going back into paid amplification is kind of the benchmark. But we are also a paid amplification business, right? We believe in buying ads. We believe in reinvesting in ads. We believe in, it, in uh, that model as being the superior model in terms of like what we're good at, which is storytelling, uh, funnel optimization. It's just we have more control than if we're out trying to like, and we still do all the other stuff. We do content. We do email. We do influencers. We do all this stuff. But like, our real root base strategy is paid amplification. And that's where 90% of our results come from. I agree with those numbers. Uh, I, I've heard you say those before and, and I totally agree. What are some, we'll, we'll kind of close off this. What are some of tips that e-commerce store owners, big or small can implement right now to start seeing success? Um, you know, I think that th this one's kind of like out there and most people might um, not so I'll just say it anyways, rather than qualifying it, how you approach your business is how your business bees. So, or how your business is. And so like a lot of people are overworked, overstressed, freaked out, anxious, angry. Ah. And like, you know, you set the tone and pace and structure for how your business is. And so if you take care of yourself, then your business has good energy from you. And so it's like, a lot of people are not taking care of their bodies. They're not moving their bodies. They're not eating well. They're not sleeping well. They're not making time for uh, so their social life and their relationships and their habits and hobbies that are fun for them. And they think that they are doing this to sacrifice for their business. Oh, my business needs my energy. I don't have time for all this stuff. But actually, they're damaging their business because if you think of yourself as a pitcher, like a pitcher of water, you can only pour when it's full. If you drain the pitcher, you can no longer pour to water the tree of your business, right? You can only give from your own surplus. So if you don't do the work to create surplus emotionally, energetically, and physically, your business will suffer. And there's a law. I don't know if it's someone's law. I can't remember the name of the person's law, but it, go, it says that work will fill the time that you give it. So if you don't set boundaries on your work life, 
it'll take over your whole life, especially if you're a, a work from home entrepreneur. And so you have got to be good at setting boundaries as a business owner. Hey, I don't start until 10 a.m. I work out before that, I eat breakfast before that, I hang out with my wife and kids before that, I start at 10 and then I take a break for lunch and then I'm done by six. So like whatever it is. And what'll happen is you'll end up getting a lot more done in those hours that you have and also being a much more fulfilled and happy person. And it's not to say that you're not gonna have times where you gotta hustle, where you gotta, you know, do those 12 to 14 hour days in launch mode and stuff like that. Yeah, that's part of it, you know? But as you go, you get better at delegation. You get better at team building. I started as a solo some random guy on his couch in Brooklyn. And now I got 70 team members and I'm doing 30 million a year. And I'm no, I'm no better than you, dude. I'm no better than anyone listening to this. I'm just interested and consistent. And I keep a positive attitude and I learn from those around me and I, and I keep at it. And like anyone can do, I'm telling you, if I can do this, anyone can do this. And you know, I look at, I go at these events, I have the opportunity to like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a public figure in this space. So I have the opportunity, which I'm really grateful for, for everyone who watches me and listens to me. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. I really do. And I uh, get the opportunity to relate with thousands of entrepreneurs and I can see it from the fucking across the room, man. I can tell who's burned out. And every entrepreneur has this experience at least once in their career. I certainly did where you just go too hard and you realize you burn yourself out. You try to sprint, but it's a marathon. And like the number one thing that you can do for success in the long run is to consistently care for yourself so that you can show up to your business because if you're at it and you're hanging out with people like Jason and you're looking for that new content and you're looking for those new strategies and you're keeping at it and you're doing the fundamentals, like you will be successful, but you have to keep at it. And I've been in this industry long enough to see a lot of people fall off and the people that are the ones who are successful, the ones who stick, they just keep going. You know, you're going to be somewhere in 10 years. Why not be a millionaire? You have the option. It's like, give yourself the time. I didn't make my first million until several years in the business, you know, and it's like, sometimes it comes faster. Sometimes it comes shorter. Uh, I was stuck. I was plateaued for like, I made, I started making a couple hundred grand a year within like two years, three years. And then I was plateaued for a long, long time. And then I figured some stuff out and I was able to, it's like, but it's like, who cares about how much money you make? Are you enjoying yourself? Number one, are you making really great products that add value to people's life? Number two, and are you profitable? Those are the questions I ask myself. If it gets bigger, wonderful. If it doesn't, well, you're having fun, you're making good shit, and you're making money. What do you care? This whole like focus on it has to be the biggest is like, man, you ever see people who run, I mean, I run a giant company now, but like I do it differently than most people. They're shackled to their business. They're overwhelmed. They're banging down pots of coffee. It's just like, man, what are we doing here? What is the point of all of this? Is the point not to have surplus money that we can then use towards causes that we find noble, like taking care of our family and community and ourselves. Why not have what you're searching for now? Why not have what you're looking for now? Enjoy yourself, take care of yourself, experience some of the success that you're chasing in the moment. It will make you more successful. I don't know. No, well said. We're going to end there, but two last rapid fire questions really quick. Best uh, platform you look forward to using in 2019 that you're bullish on. Uh, Instagram stories. It's, I mean, look, everyone knows that it's huge right now. That the if you look at Instagram stories, dude, think about this. I have forty thousand fans on my personal fan page. When I make a post on it, I get twenty people to see it. I have ten thousand or fourteen thousand fans on Instagram. When I make a post on Instagram stories, twenty percent of them see it. The reach on there is crazy. Not Messenger. Uh, Messenger is slow growth. If people aren't adopting it the way that I had predicted. Um, I was so bullish on Messenger, man, and. Uh, Facebook's really struggling for people to adopt the platform. I still think it's coming, but I think it's just much slower than I thought it was going to be like by this year, everyone was going to be using it, but it's like they're having trouble getting people to put their payment cards on there so that, for, you know, they wanted it to be like Venmo where you send your friends yeah. money on messenger. It's just not adopting fast enough. And I don't know quite why. So once I like it, but I'm not quite as jazzed on it as I once was. One sentence, if you had every e-commerce store owner listening to you right now, and you could say one sentence to them, what would it be? Please change your store to Shopify and purchase my application, Zipify Pages. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so no, much. I'm just kidding. I would say, hey, thank you for being a part of this really amazing community. And you know, support other e-commerce brands. Go buy from their sites. Be a steward of the internet. Support your fellow merchants. You know, show up to events. Share what you know. Rising tides raise all ships. Let's help each other. 
And, uh, you know, I appreciate people like you who are out there putting out content, helping people. Um, you know, you don't have to do this show. You do it because you love it. You do it because you want to add value. And like, I think that's a beautiful thing. And I appreciate you having me on and I will share this and thank you. Thank you so much. People want to get a hold of you. How can they find you? Smartmarketer.com or just Google Ezra Firestone. You'll find me. I'm around. Ezra, honestly, this was more of a pleasure for me than maybe to my listeners. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, man.